Welcome to The Pick List, the podcast for curious food industry minds. Every week, we bring you our pick of articles from the world of food and grocery retail and explore what they tell us about how our food industry is changing in these extraordinary times. We chat about the major news from nationals and big trade titles, but we also love unearthing gems from niche publications and sharing brilliant, quirky food stories that change the way we think about the food we eat and produce. I'm Julia Glotz. And I'm Laura Ryan. It's great to have you with us. Let's start the show. Hi, Laura. How are you? Yeah, great, Julia. How are you getting on? How's your week been? It's been very good. Thank you. Um, I've been busy uh, delivering some online training on how to get coverage in the trade media. Um, and I, I've created some some videos for that and then had a live training session um, with a client last week, which was really good fun. Lots of interesting discussions. How about you? Yeah, great week. Thank you. Um, I've been busy chairing some industry meetings, which has been really interesting. And just you saying there about doing stuff online, it's a great opportunity, isn't it, to try the tech and get more people that maybe wouldn't have worked online more and more so and make us more productive. So I've enjoyed it. It's been going well. So we've got some great articles this week, haven't we? Are you going to kick us off with the first one? Yes. So my first pick this week is from The Grocer, and it's an article called Tipping Point, Can the Pandemic Reignite Click and Collect? And it was written by George Knott. Now, the question it raises really is a question we've been hearing in various guises throughout the pandemic, which is how much of the new shopper behavior we have been seeing is permanent and how much of it is uh, more of a temporary reaction to the specific situation we find ourselves in because of coronavirus. Um, it's a question that has come to the fore, particularly in the context of online grocery. There's been a huge boom in demand for online grocery um, and a boom in demand for click and collect. Online delivery slots were, and in many cases still are, difficult to get hold of. So the option to order online and then pick up from a store suddenly became very attractive. Despite, and I think that is the crucial point here, click and collect not exactly being a runaway success before the pandemic, certainly in grocery. Growth in click and collect was plateauing before the crisis, but now it's booming. Um, there's a quote in there from Sainsbury's saying that they're now fulfilling more click and collect grocery orders in a single day than they were fulfilling in a full week prior to lockdown. So the question the article poses is, you know, does that point to shoppers actually reappraising click and collect? Will they continue to choose click and collect more often once delivery slots are no longer difficult to get hold of? Or are they going to go back to home delivery the minute that becomes a little bit easier? Um, and George interviewed a whole range of experts for this article. And the verdict on that question is... Um, well, this is the hallmarks of a more permanent change overall. Partly that is because click and collect services are uh, becoming more convenient, faster. There's several retailers now offering express options. I think Sainsbury's in particular is looking at a 30-minute um, a slot that you can have. Um, more retailers are looking at lockers, unmanned lockers, so that, you know, as a customer, you basically um, can just pick up your order without having to have any contact with anyone. Um, so there's certainly more compelling consumer arguments for click and collect than there might have been a few months ago. The other reason the article points to is that retailers have a very good reason for pushing click and collect harder in these sort of post-COVID times. They've invested in lots of click and collect capacity now, of course, so that's a good reason. But also making online grocery profitable is notoriously difficult because of how expensive it is to deliver to the last mile. Profitability is more achievable with a click and collect model. And the experts in the article um, are quite careful to say that it's not that Profitability is achievable with click and collect, but it is more achievable. It gets you a little bit further along that way. Um, you cut out the costs associated with the last mile. You also reduce labor costs if you let customers pick up from unmanned, um, unmanned lockers and so on and so forth. And automation, including through micro-fulfillment centers, which several retailers are looking at, can also improve profitability yet further. 
So click and collect looks like it's one of those changes that have come out of the crisis that are likely to be um, a more prominent part of our grocery landscape in the future. But, and I think that's the, um, the sort of crucial point, retailers mustn't rest on their laurels. Um, there's several experts in this piece that point to the fact that as demand for click and collect increases, as it becomes a more common way for people to buy their groceries, consumer expectations are going to continue to rise. Um, we're going to start having discussions about how you differentiate, differentiate yourself through click and collect, how you can add um, you know, more superior service levels to click and collect. Um, all of those considerations are going to become more important as time goes on. But certainly for now, this looks like one of those post-COVID changes that is here to stay. What did you make of it? Have you been uh, using click and collect for your yeah, grocery shopping? I, ha I have. You. I love the article. It was a really interesting article. And um, I've used click and collect quite a lot, actually, over the uh, last couple of months, picking up um, groceries, a lot for family members, actually. And that's easy for them that they can do all the ordering. And if they haven't been able to get a slot, um, you know, um, to direct to home delivery, then pick to click and collect. And I've maybe gone and got it for them, which is actually uh, under the radar, made me do a lot of uh, consumer research on the different retailer click and collects. So the only one I haven't done actually is Tesco because uh, randomly I haven't got a big Tesco near me. I must be the only person in the country that doesn't. But um, looking at uh, JS, Asda and Morrison's, it's really interesting how they're all really different. Um, and it, it feels a little bit like a lot of these retailers, it is a bit of an afterthought. Um, they've put a, a car wash style um, <laughs> structure by their main door. Um, and I experienced this on Friday, actually. You, you drive up to, to get your groceries. You, you're battling away a little bit with people that are trying to walk to the cash machine at the front of the store where people are, you know, going in and across the zebra crossing and disabled parking and it's busy. And then you get a member of staff coming out who are really challenged on a bit of wonky pavement with a massive trolley trying to battle get uh, past people um, and I think it's maybe done better where the click and collect is away from the main door uh, and Sainsbury's do this quite a lot don't they they have a maybe a, a delivery truck in the corner of their car park so to keep that traffic away from their main door and to make it a lot slicker um, I don't know Morrison's for example you sometimes go and it's someone out the sort of back of the warehouse come out and I always feel really sorry for the staff because they always feel like that they're, they're battling with something that's a bit of an add-on as I say so hopefully if this is something that continues to grow the basic logistics of click and collect will be continue to be improved so that service level feels better rather than uh, oh gosh you know we're trying to get this um, loads of cartons down a, a, a dodgy bit of curbing to the back of this person's car. What's your first pick this week? So my first pick is from the Yorkshire Post and the Yorkshire Post have had a bit of a scoop. It's an exclusive on Morrison's and it says huge Morrison shake-up means four-day working week for 1,500 head office staff. And this is an article by Lizzie Murphy. And this is supermarket giant Morrison's is embarking on a huge shake-up of its working practices, introducing a four-day week, um, which I, I think is absolutely groundbreaking for the um, retail um, sector and we haven't seen another retailer let alone in, in grocery go for this and individuals will reduce their working hours from 40 to 37 and a half hours a week working nine instead of eight hour days for four days plus six hour shift one Saturday a month and pay will not be affected so when you see on the face of this, you think, oh, this must be about pandemic, social distancing, getting everyone back into Hillmore, um, their head office in Bradford. And it's worth mentioning this is just for their head office uh, staff and a few at uh, the Nutmeg Clothing uh, office down in Leicestershire and not for their um, manufacturing based staff. Um, and you think, well, you know, they're going to need that space to get everyone back in. But further in the article, it's saying, actually, this was a working plan well before COVID-19. It said new ways of working would ensure greater coverage across the working week, continuation of social distance and a better work-life balance for employees and stretching folks to working across six days, I guess, as, as they, they do work one Saturday um, in every four, will allow the retailer to be more responsive. A spokesman said, we've learned a lot during the COVID outbreak but this has been planned for some time and we trialed it last year with some colleagues so it was planned it was a planned decision 
this is a, a massive change, as I say, for um, a retailer to go down to a, a four day week and um, essentially reduce the amount of hours that, that these 1500 people are working at. But when you think of it in, in a longer term strategic position, you've got two of the big four uh, grocery retailers up in Yorkshire. Uh, Hillmore House being in the middle of Bradford without great um, um, public transport links. And anyone that's been knows that even if you take a car, sometimes that's tr tricky to get parked there and it's challenging. So when you think about them trying to get the best talent into their business uh, and the best people to work for them, is this maybe a move to help them be a step above? And when you think about the data we see of millennials and that work-life balance and what's important to individuals, maybe folks don't want to be working five days a week, six in the morning till seven at night at a supermarket head office. Maybe they want that better work-life balance and maybe... Um, even though it was planned before by Morrison's, seeing people working from home and having a bit more flexibility, actually seeing the retailers step up even more so, has given them confidence to do this. I guess for me, I think the big challenge will be if you are in a whatever role, a, a grocery head office, but probably a, a senior role, how brave is it going to be for you not to be able to not answer those emails on a Tuesday or a Thursday or whatever your allocated day off is? As we all know, it's really hard not to now in the world that we work in to, to pick up um, uh, emails and, and, and make phone calls on days that you're not supposed to be. So it's going to take some real discipline to, from the top to say, no, you're not working on X day and you need to pick that up on the following. I think it's a really interesting move um, and I think absolutely should be applauded. I think this whole pandemic has forced us to um, look much more closely at what effective working actually looks like. And I think, you know, remote working is already opening up so many possibilities for, um, you know, companies outside of London, really outside of the southeast, um, to attract more talent and to be a little bit less sort of bound by geography. So I think this is really interesting and, and your point about how it might be a way for Morrisons to position themselves to be a really attractive employer, I could definitely see that both from a, both from a sort of remote talent point of view, but also in terms of, um, you know, just being a really um, attractive workplace that sort of values work-life balance. Um, so yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see if we will see other retailers follow suit. I certainly find, you know, I've, I've been freelance now for nearly a year and I certainly wasn't a slacker before while I was on staff. But I think what's really interesting when you look at these moves is, you know, I think companies that have experimented with going down from a five day working week to a four day working week find that actually it is reasonably easy in many cases to compensate for that loss of a day because there is a lot of dead time that you have, you know, even if you're very, very efficient and if you work hard, there is always a little bit of slack in the system that goes along with having that very predictable schedule where you're in every day, Monday to Friday, regardless of your work load, regardless of what you're working on. So I think what's quite exciting about this is that it's potentially forcing us, it's forcing employers to ask much harder questions about what you want people to do and measuring their performance based on very sort of clear deliverables rather than how many hours across how many days you get to force them to be in an office, which I always think is, is, a, is a massively unproductive way to look at someone's productivity and the sort of work that they, um, that they produce for you. So yeah, I think if you sort of loosen that um, five day working week and you focus much more on, you know, what are the projects you need to deliver on? What are some of the things that I'm expecting you to achieve? And take, you know, take however long that takes you. If it takes you, you know, if you get all of your work done in two days, why wouldn't you allow that person to then have three days off, um, you know, for the, for the rest of the week? So, yeah, I think it's really exciting. And I, I'd be very interested to see if they do decide to, um, A, roll it out across the business, but also foresee some other retailers follow suit. 
is a great uh, example you've given there and actually that slack in the system sometimes it's uh, I guess reliant for any business on their internal tech systems or whatever it may be and actually if you force people to a, a four-day week then some of the back-end systems have to be smarter so in time by having that cultural change for people will they have a better suggestions about right we could change x y and z which will allow us to be pacier and quicker and maybe Maybe that's a really I like that reverse engineering of, of, of pushing people to lose that slack and also actually it'll highlight where th th things can be better for the business all around really interesting one to watch that's for sure what's your uh, second article so my second pick this week is from the spoon and it's called the UK launches nine ag and food tech projects including air protein consortium called react first and it was written by Michael Wolf. Um, it's a fairly long headline, a fairly detailed headline, uh, and it pretty much tells you what the article is about. And the reason this caught my eye was the Air Protein Consortium, as they put it. Um, this is a consortium led by a Nottingham-based company called Deep Branch Biotechnology. And it's working on some tech that can turn CO2 taken from a power station into animal feed using a process referred to as gas fermentation. It's all very, very techy. I'm not going to pretend I understand how they do this. There's a diagram in the Spoon article um, that I looked at for quite some time. It still left my head spinning, but the upshot um, from this article is that you could end up with fish and poultry feed that has a carbon footprint that's potentially up to 75% smaller than other feeds because the process uses very little water and it doesn't require arable farmland to grow crops that then end up going into animal feed and um, which sounds pretty compelling and I think it sort of speaks to an interesting recent trend where animal feed and the environmental impact associated with animal feed is becoming um, just a more important consideration, I think, for food manufacturers and retailers and also for consumers. Lots of companies are realising that much of their environmental footprint is tied up in those animal feed supply chains. So we're seeing more moves to really address sustainability um, within animal feed. The other reason this project caught my eye um, is also the names attached to this particular project. So there's Biomar, which is a fish feed producer. There's AB Agri, big name in animal feed. But there's also Sainsbury's, um, which is involved in this project and will look at ways to apply the technology at scale. And all of it is part of the um, is is part of a twenty four million pound government fund to support a range of next generation food and farming technologies um, that are designed to make UK food production more efficient. Um, so I I love these sort of techie projects. I think air protein just the concept absolutely boggles my mind. I'm really excited to see um, what commercial application of something like that could look like. Um, but as I said, I think it's it's particularly significant because it points to this growing attention we're seeing on animal feed and the environmental impact associated with animal feed in particular. So um, definitely an interesting one to watch and seeing names such as Sainsbury's there in the mix, I think tells you um, a lot about the potential commercial application um, of, of technology like that as well. What did you make of it? Uh, I'm glad you said that you didn't understand the diagram because I looked at it for about 10 minutes as well and I thought I'm not quite sure of this I'm, I'm glad it's Julia that's explaining the article but um, I, I thought it was really interesting and interesting that so much government cash in this actually as well as um, if the uh, getting big retailers in board, in board such as Sainsbury's and I think you're totally right uh, animal feed and um, I guess methane emissions and um, carbon footprint more generally is coming more and more to the fore for consumers um, and we've just seen um, Burger King last week haven't we announced that feeding lemongrass to some of their cattle to reduce uh, their carbon footprint uh, for their products and being really actually uh, ambitious and I guess consumer focused in that and a, a message maybe I don't know would consumers really care about or be bothered about five ten years ago but now making adverts and just looking at their YouTube I think we had four 
normally in watches um, in less than a week. So there's obviously quite a lot of interest around this. And it'll, as you say, it'll be interesting not only um, how it's brought into the commercial space, but how it's branded as well. To, as, you, as we say, you know, this has to be converted into something that a consumer feels that they can understand. When you're talking about CO2 from a chemical plant it's it's quite or a power plant it sounds quite confusing and non-foody and even though that's going to be fed to animals and consumers aren't uh, consuming that that byproduct as such they're going to want to make it feel wholesome and there's been so much around grass-fed and all this sort of movement over the the years for consumers to think what's important I think um yeah the, the branding is definitely going to be key in time otherwise it's going to be another of these products which doesn't come to market as well as it could do. Yeah, I think you raise a really interesting point. I'm not sure whether this strikes me as something that needs to have a consumer branding side to it. I think particularly with um, with, with fish feed, um, I'd say even to an extent with poultry feed, it feels like there's less of a focus, uh, certainly at this stage, on the feed beyond the kind of general, you know, GM debate that we've obviously seen um, for, for quite some time. But um, yeah, I... I, I I wonder how much of that you need to communicate to a consumer or whether you can simply say this um, is, you know, this chicken or, or this fish has been produced using more environmentally friendly feed. Um, I'm sure that's going to be quite hotly debated as they develop that technology, because as you say, if, if there is a decision to communicate this on some level, you then have quite a job on your hands because it sounds really impressive and quite sci-fi, but not necessarily massively edible which is always yes. a, a challenge with these sorts of technologies so it'll be an interesting one to watch but I think that Burger King example is, is key and just shows you how much that sort of animal feed conversation has moved into the mainstream I think consumers are starting to connect the dots much more between um, environmental footprint particularly of, of uh, you know meat products and what goes into feed and what those animals are fed what's the um, what's the second article you've picked my my second article is from uh, Nam News and it's Tesco supports online refillable container scheme. Um, and this really interested me because um, off the back of the pandemic, we'll be always thinking about single use plastic that we've we spoken about on this show before and how consumers are going to be more, I guess, heightened about making sure everything's clean that, that's coming into their home, particularly where food's concerned. Um, but this is a project by Tesco and it's a, a project that actually has been trialled both in France and the US previously uh, and it's had strong growth um, in recent months there. So they're the bringing it to the UK. And what it actually is, it's um, a new scheme where online shoppers are able to buy leading food house household cleaning and toiletry brands in reusable containers which are delivered to their door and then collected once used sanitized to be refilled. Uh, the supermarket group has joined forces with zero waste shopping platform Loop to pilot the scheme um, that has a potential potential to significantly cut down plastic waste and other single-use packaging. So it's not necessarily uh, food products to begin with, it's may maybe more uh, cleaning type products, although it says initially 150 SKUs from brands including Heinz, Danone, Coca-Cola, Molten Brown, Nivea and Purcell will be included. So it all sounds great and then when you sort of read down into a bit more of the article it talks about Loop being a spin-off of the waste management company TerraCycle uh, and they will sort the containers for cleaning um, for hygiene purposes and with the food safety firm Ecolab and they will then they will be refilled by the manufacturer and the way it works is you pay a deposit basically once you log on to the Loop website you say what you want to order and then you pay a refundable deposit for the items. Um, what really interested me though um, when, you, when you get a bit more into the detail of this is the products are delivered in a reusable loop bag by courier firm DPD who also collect the containers when they're empty and as you've just alluded to when we were chatting about the click and collect model the cost to get a courier and potentially the um, environmental impact to deliver something that's reusable to your home 
and then you use it and then them to come back and pick it up and take it away. And if that was part of maybe a normal online delivery, um, that would be great. But if it's an additional delivery, which wasn't quite clear um, in the article, then it'll be interesting to see how the, that all knits together in terms of the overall um, impact on the environment. There is an option shoppers can drop containers off at um, one of two and a half thousand DPD collection points. And that uh, loops back to our last week's show, wasn't it? When we were chatting about coffee pods and the fact that they had to be uh, taken to a specific uh, distribution centre to be um, uh, recycled. The online pilot will be delivered uh, to the whole of the UK mainland with plans to roll out the scheme to Tesco uh, bricks, and bricks and mortar stores uh, next year. I think this is really exciting. I've been looking at Loop for, for some time. So this was um, a pilot or that the launch of, of Loop in the UK was delayed because of COVID. So it's been on the cards for some time. And I think there are lots of people who've been watching this with great interest. Um, I'm less concerned, I think, at this stage about some of the logistical bits. I, I agree that if you end up having lots of couriers potentially involved, I'm not sure that's going to be scalable, but it is a pilot. So I suppose at this stage, you're trying to figure out what sort of consumer acceptance is and, and, and consumer demand for this is. I think it's really interesting and it's really exciting and I'm pleased to see this launch now because we have seen quite a few sort of sustainable packaging or reusable packaging um, zero waste trials being put on hold because of understandable concerns around COVID. Um, as I think the article makes clear, or as, as TerraCycle has made clear repeatedly, um, there is no evidence to suggest that using a system like this would present any risk, but sort of facts don't always help you in a situation where consumers are concerned and everyone's sort of a little bit paranoid about getting a, you know, catching a virus. So um, I think it's encouraging to see that they clearly feel it's now possible to launch this. And I think the key thing here is that even though they talk about potentially having a bricks and mortar component later on, this is an online um, set up. And so it actually fulfills quite a few sort of social distancing requirements that shoppers would be looking for. And it fits in with how lots of shoppers are already shopping. So um, yeah, I, I'll be watching it with great interest. I think particularly um, around, as you say, cleaning products, but also personal care products, I know I feel like I probably buy the same shower gel every time I go to the supermarket and I, you know, merrily collect plastic bottles week in, week out. I would be very happy to no longer have those and simply have the product refilled. Um, so, yes, on a personal level, really excited about that. But I also think it's going to set an important message and a sort of direction for for where um, some of these other zero waste trials that we've been, been watching will be taken post COVID as well. The one thing that fascinates me in all of this is what it does to brand loyalty. Um, because once you are in a system like that, um, are you really going to be swapping brands? Are you really going to be trying new products quite to the same extent? Or are you much more likely to stick with one particular product? So I think that will be interesting um, from, a, from a brand point of view. How do you get people to try out your product if they're already committed to um, having the same product refilled all the time? Um, and what does it do to price sensitivity, you know, once you're locked into um, a system like that? So uh, fascinating one to watch, but I think really positive signal to see it launched now. Definitely. What's your final pick? So my final pick this week is from Smithsonian Magazine, and it's an article called Why It's Unsettling That Anything Could Be Cake. Uh, it's about an internet meme that's been making the rounds, sparked by hyper-realistic cakes that look like things other than cakes. Um, and when I say hyper-realistic, I mean, they are incredibly realistic. You'd be absolutely fooled. Um, this whole meme was sparked um, by a Turkish baker who makes these incredibly realistic cakes that look like sandals, uh, that look like to toilet roll, that look like potted plants or bars of soap. Um, crazily realistic. Um, the video was shared by uh, BuzzFeed, BuzzFeed Tasty, 
went viral and it sparked lots of reactions and, and reaction videos of people, you know, sort of pretending to no longer be trusting household objects in their own homes because, you know, if these things can be cake, anything could be cake. Um, so far, so fluffy. I do like a good meme and this one was quite fun. Um, but what the article does in a sort of typical erudite fashion that you would expect from the Smithsonian is ask the question, um, why do we find this so fascinating? Why are we so drawn in by these hyper-realistic cakes? And in particular, it looks at how many people have responded to the original video, which is that they have sort of taken this idea that anything could be cake to an absurd extreme. So there's like one version where um, people are saying that, you know, you try to call for help, but the phone is cake and then help arrives, but the help is cake. You know, you had people tweeting that, you know, they sort of talk about the cake meme with their wife, but their wife turns out to be cake. Anyway, so Smithsonian is asking, why are we so fascinated by this and why are we reacting to this cake meme in this um, particular manner? And the answer, according to psychologists, is that foods such as these sort of sculptural, hyper-realistic cakes, um, they subvert our expectations. We think we are looking at a bar of soap because the object we're looking at looks exactly like a bar of soap, but actually it's a delicious sponge cake. That is a disruptive experience that ends up leaving us feeling quite unbalanced. Um, I mean, there's in fact a an artist who makes hyper-realistic cakes quoted in the article saying that her followers on social media are now so suspicious of anything she posts that they always ask, is it cake? Even if she just posts a picture of her face. Um, and that sort of feeling of being a bit unbalanced, sort of, you know, your brain looking at, at an object and sort of thinking it's one thing, but you can't quite be sure, that can lead to an increase of cortisol in the brain, of the stress hormone cortisol in the brain. And reacting with humour, taking things to extremes, laughing about how everything might now be cake, is um, a coping strategy for us to handle that uncomfortable disconnect between what we think we see, a bar of soap, and what we then learn to be the truth, which is the thing that we thought was a bar of soap is in fact cake. So as one of the psychologists puts it, responding with humour helps to manage that cortisol response and helps trigger additional positive neurochemical responses. All of which I thought was fascinating. And I just, I love the way this article took what's a reasonably silly meme about, you know, croc sandals turning out to be cake and actually looking at what it is about a meme like that that makes it so irresistible and sparks these sort of um, quite existential questions about um, the nature of uh, the nature of things and, and the nature of cake. So um, yeah, it's a fascinating read. What did you make of it? And uh, would you would you eat any of those uh, very hyper realistic looking cakes? Well, I've got a serious sugar addiction, so I guess my answer has to be yes. Uh, and it's definitely worth having a, a look at the article and looking at some of the videos because I hadn't seen them before and absolutely ridiculously realistic. Um, but one thing that always does strike me with those sort of products is you think the amount of human hand that's been over them because they are like a piece of work, the, uh, a piece of artwork. They're not just uh, bung in your oven and quick put a bit of icing on top um, that you'd you'd get at my house if you were lucky. Um, that Yeah, you think that they've, they've been mauled a little bit. So I like the idea and I think they're a great, I, I guess, again, social media um, uh, option, aren't they? It reminds me of those freak shakes and, you know, people buying products just to post on social media, not actually to eat them. Um, but uh, yeah, I thought they were an absolute piece of uh, art in particular. Very good. What's your final pick this week? Uh, my final pick this week is from the Sunday Times and it's an article written by James Timson of uh, Timson's um, Key Cutters and Cobblers and it's entitled In a World of Uncertainty for SMEs, Kindness is Key. Um, the reason I really like this article is, as you know, I do like a CEO interview and this uh, did not disappoint in terms of seeing behind the curtain 
and um, how Timpsons have dealt with um, the pandemic. But I was lucky enough to see James chat at a, a conference probably about uh, 10, 12 years ago. And some of the things he said then about, you know, how he leads his business and his transparency for leading his business, uh, I found really inspiring and still, still bring home today. So I was really interested to see um, what he had to say. I guess for grocery, uh, Timpsons are, are, are super important because they're sat in a lot of car parks in, uh, in in grocery stores and in addition in some of the stores too. And they've got an estate of over 2,000 stores um, across the UK and recently um, picked up the um, Max Spielman um, uh, photo developing chain too. So super interesting. So uh, what he's saying in this article is, um, I, and I like the opening to it, he said, I have a, an increasingly dog-eared piece of paper on my desk, uh, which each morning I plot the previous day's sales and our bank balance. It's not pretty reading right now. And he goes through how um, he didn't go to business school, but I suspect no one sat through a lecture called How to Survive a Pandemic. Nine months ago, we took our senior management team to a two-night retreat. The plan was to have fun, focus on the year ahead, and spend half a day role-playing through various disaster scenarios. Our auditors and non-exec directors encouraged us to add the latter to the day's agenda and we joked that if we practised they would never happen. The pandemic was not on our list and it was thought that an absolute worst case scenario we might face would involve warehouse burning down, a ransomware attack or a credit card network failure. Even if we'd acted out a pandemic response, would we have understood what could happen or the scale of its impact? I doubt it. He then goes on to talk about the fact that he believes it'll take three years hard work and difficult decisions and hopefully some more help from government that will allow them to see what's going to happen to their business going forwards. And he doesn't mention it in the article, but I remember when uh, uh, lockdown was getting lifted and Timpsons are um, classed as an essential retailer. Rishi Sunak was, one, was pictured in a Timpsons getting some keys cut pretty early doors. And I think obviously Timpsons being such a big retailer, have a good relationship with government by the looks of it. Uh, he talks about, before we'd even heard, uh, even heard of the word furlough, I decided that if we had to close our shops temporarily, we would give our colleagues 100% of their pay. And that was one of the things that I remember back, as I say, to hearing him speak, the trust he has for his colleagues and how, even though they are a huge business, that family culture is hugely important to them. Um, and I remember him talking about, and I, I presume they still do it, he would give all um, his employees their birthday as a day off and said, you know, that was really important that, yes, it did cost the business, but actually showing the caring and value was more important to them. So in terms of, of paying uh, their their colleagues 100% of their pay, it said it helped more than 5,000 families and it cost Timpsons in excess of 6 million. Money well spent, in my opinion. Uh, and he goes on to say, it's not just money that's important, it's communication everyone receives while on furlough. The area managers have WhatsApp groups buzzing with positive stories of fun competitions. And then goes on to say more latterly, um, when we opened 200 um, stores a month ago to test things and now 99% of their store is open, they've had that um, WhatsApp group to talk about social distancing and PPE. Who then finally talks about um, how he's done a tour of some of the, the, the shops and talked about big city centre shops are much quieter than suburban ones. And that really makes me think, and I guess chatting anecdotally to industry contacts over the last couple of weeks, you know, are city centres going to come back or are the suburbs and small market towns like I live going to become more and more popular because you're not necessarily going to have to go and work in a, in a big city and you can work from home? And he talks that they take more money in supermarkets that have pods in their car parks rather than located in store because people feel safer, which I thought was interesting. And when you think about those pods, they are really small and you're probably only letting one person in. So you will feel quite contained and quite safe. He talked about earlier in the article about it would take three years, but then he goes on to say it'll be at least two years before they know what trading patterns will look like. And then he, he finishes the article, and this is what I really like. It doesn't talk about cobbling shoes or printing um, photos or cutting keys or uh, cleaning clothes because they have the John Johnson's uh, dry cleaning business. He says, I hope that all businesses will recognise that a kinder, more diverse and less hierarchical they are, the more relevant they will be and the more likely they are to succeed. 
And I think we can take a lot out of that in terms of what I've seen from business leaders in, in the, the grocery sector. The more transparent they've been, open and caring, and yes, there's tough business decisions to make. And this week we, we've heard again that you know there's going to be more job losses for M&S in particular, and we will see more every single week. But that kindness and that trust you know, that, that business leaders can show, I think will help set them apart. Yeah, it won't pay their pay their bills and pay their staff, but ultimately, hopefully consumers will see that and want to trust them. So I felt really warm by that article. I really like the piece and I have to say, so this is the dangers of, um, of giving this to, to a journalist, but also someone who now spends quite a lot of time advising companies for how to write op-ed pieces. I think this is a really well done bylined article because, you know, as you say, it's actually appearing under his byline. It's not an interview that's sort of mediated, but it's him talking directly to the reader. We hear his voice. And I think um, what stood out to me Aside from you know the positive messages that that they have come through, which I think are certainly um, very welcome, but not it's exactly the kind of stuff that you would expect um, James Timpson to say based on what we already know of his business. But what you get from reading the article is a sense of his voice, and I think a lot of um, a lot of executives a lot of companies really struggle with that when they write bylined articles for publication you end up with this um incredibly generic corporate tone of voice that really could have been written by absolutely anyone if you took the byline off it could have come from any number of companies and what I like here is that this could only have come from him. And it's not just because of the specific references to the business, of course, but because you get a sense of the sort of turns of phrase that he uses, um, you know, the, the way he sort of talks about his experience, you get a sense that this is this is a person, you know, it feels authentic. Um, and I would say, you know, so aside from the kind of messages for, for the wider retail um, sector, I think if you are um, someone who is interested in writing um, op-eds for publication, this is actually a really good example to look at of someone who manages to, you know, in a way, promote his business here. I mean, he does talk about all the wonderful things that his business is doing, Um which is always a tricky thing to pull off. It can come off as incredibly self-promotional when you do that in, in op-eds. But this one gets away with it. And I think it is because you get the sense that this is a real person talking to you. And the other thing you get is shades of grey. You know, you don't just get everything is wonderful and everything we've done is one wonderful decision after the other. You do get a sense that this is a business that is struggling in certain aspects, that this is a chief executive who's had to make some tough decisions, who's um, had some dark moments. And again, I think that always buys you a little bit of leeway with readers to actually talk about the positive stuff because they've also heard you acknowledge um, the the stuff that, that isn't so positive. So um, yes, I think they are really important to grocery retail and I think they're an interesting um, business and I, I, I like the message that he's putting out there. But actually my main takeaway from this was I think this is a really well executed opinion article, really well executed op-ed um, that a lot of corporate op-ed writers uh, could learn quite a lot from. I love it. We've heard from the expert there. And do you think because they're privately owned, that gives them the uh, confidence to be so authentic? Do you th or, or do you actually think businesses with shareholders could be? Because the, the, the tone of that resonates with me about what we see from Iceland and how you know bold they can be. But again, a privately owned company. Yeah, I don't think it has as much to do with privately owned versus publicly owned. I think Iceland is a good example. We've talked before about um, Richard Walker and, and, and his blog, I think, often um, gets a lot of this right as well in terms of tone of voice. I think it's more to do with 
um, individual leaders and the style of communications that comes out of certain organizations. I think there are publicly owned companies that get this right. I think there are privately com- uh, privately owned companies that get this completely wrong. So I think it's uh, it's less about that. I think it's more about the comms team and I think it's about a style of leadership that is comfortable with um showing the human behind the sort of corporate decision making I think that's what it comes down to so what you're really saying is no one's got an excuse no one's got an excuse um but also if you want people to buy into your story if you want people to understand your values and and connect with you on a personal level I think it's this style of writing that is often required it does a much better job of uh, connecting with people and getting your story across than the sort of identikit corporate op-eds that get churned out in many cases. I've loved it it's been great chatting to you and love chatting through our six articles. Yeah same here really good to talk to you take care. See you next week bye. That's all we have for you this week. Thank you so much for listening. You can find links to the articles we discussed in the show notes at thepicklist.co.uk. If you enjoyed our show, please subscribe, give it a rating and leave a review. It makes a massive difference to our podcast and helps us reach more people in the food industry who'd enjoy listening to The Picklist. Thanks again for listening. See you next time.